All right, here we are, Monday night, 7 o'clock. It's another evening of the creativity of God. I am excited. I know I say that every week, but I'm double excited this week uh, to bring my friend, my brother, my partner, Dr. Mike Kingsley, to you. Uh, about 20 years ago, I attended a pastor's prayer co conference or gathering, and who walked in but this uh, young man from Uganda by the name of Dr. Mike Kingsley sat right next to me. And for 20 years, God has knit our heart and, and called us to walk together. And his story is going to fit so well with what we've been talking about, because I am convinced that God has been working his creativity into our life all along. Uh, I mean, our whole life. And we're just not always aware of all that has been built into us. And I want to get right into it, uh, introducing Mike to you, but I just wanted to share with you that I, I believe the work of the enemy, one of the major works of the enemy is to get us to be unaware of what's actually been built into us and unaware of what's actually being built into us in our present season. And uh, Mike's story is going to challenge us and stir us to be aware of what we have. And so without any further ado, I want to bring my brother in and introduce you to Dr. Mike Kingsley. My brother. Yes. How are you? I am so well. I've been looking forward to this day for us to come before God's people and uh, just uh, allow the Lord to use us as always whenever we're together. Yes. You know, a great amount of things uh, happen. And I I'm very gladly, very appreciative of uh, how God, you know, needed us together 20 years ago. And 20 years later, we're still uh, excited about the Lord. That's one of the things I've known about you is that you've not ceased to be a lover of God, to be a man that is after God's heart, to know the Lord. I'm, you know, to find somebody very consistent, is that that's a testimony in itself. The consistency of God. That's very wonderful. I've watched that with you. Thank you, brother. Thank, Thank you, you so much. You know, um, God is doing so much uh, in your life these days. Uh, world Trumpet Television uh, is emerging on, this, on the world scene. Yes. And uh, God has raised you up to birth this vision and this work around the world. Yes. Um, you didn't just wake up one day and, and that happened, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> no, you never wake up one day and that happens. No, it's, you've been engaged in a in a process for a long time of God working into your life, uh, spiritual maturity and creativity. It's, it's in his heart. And, you know, I, I got to say, ever since I met you, you've always been someone that had a big vision, someone yeah. who believed for the great things of God. And that was formed in you even from a very young age. That's true. Not just uh, because of the, the best environment, but actually because of the worst environment. The worst environment. Talk about that. Yeah. Yes. Where'd, how did it all begin for you? You know, thank you for asking, you know, that question. And the context in which you asked it makes a lot of um, sense because you have to go back to the genesis of things. It is um, those moments when, when, when God just you know, makes time and season happen. And what I mean by that is how do we birth what God has entrusted inside of us? Or how does it, how is it incubated inside of us unless there is an environment that works against, you know, against it, against, mm -hmm. there's always been that force. Talk about gravity that pushes things down, but this, this is a, this, the forces around us and in our environment. And I'm born in a country, Uganda. Uh, by the time I began to open my eyes, it was chaos. How do you get a baby boy out of the womb? And as soon as he begins to understand life, it's only chaos. You know, I remember the very first time that I, uh, you know, I became a father, digressed a little bit. You know, I cried because I looked at Davin at the time you know, my 13 year old boy, I, uh, I cried because I kind of felt that it, it kind of felt scary that 
you know, I love to have a child. That was my first son. And, but at the same time, I'm looking at the environment around him and I'm like, Lord, you know, the chances of my survival, I can tell my story, but how is he going to survive? And yet that's happening while he's in America, not where I was born. Mm. In my condition where I was born, the chances of survival are zero. Like, like anything, anytime can happen. If a stone doesn't hit you, if a tree doesn't hit you, if the wall, it's a bug, a snake, you know, anybody can kill you, thugs, everything. And then out of that story, Brother Dan, you know, somehow God through my father, who I love very much, my, my, my you know, Bishop Charles, God came through him and transformed him. And I've shared the testimony where Idi Amin wanted to kill him. And, and, and none of his friends were killed and he survived. And his survival was, he prayed and said, Lord, if you save me out of this place, and those places, those times they used to take people into what we call uh, the safe houses. Those type of safe houses is that you never come back alive. So you, you're mm -hmm. dead. And so, and so Idi Amin's guys took him in the safe house and that's where they slaughtered, where they killed. They did a lot of torturing things. You know, some of the things you've, you've had in the news. And it's that time he prayed a prayer and said, Lord, if you save me out of here, I'll give you back Uganda. What does that even mean? If, if it's never been put in your spirit, how do you tell God, I'll give you back a nation? How did you know that? Only by the spirit of God. And soon as he prayed, a door opened. When the door opened, it was one of the guys who knew him in the army, one of his friends, who, never, who happens not to know where he is, didn't even know that he could even meet him there. He's surprised. And he tells the guys around him, he said, don't kill him. I'll kill him myself. Because if he never said that statement, they could have just put a cup in his head, just like his friends who had already down. And so they let him go because it was a top guy in the army. They let him go. And he hit my dad, you know, for 90 days. We looked at for my dad, you know, mass graves everywhere. We couldn't find him. And guess what? After 90 days, we're at his place of work. All of a sudden, I see this car. I see this car coming back. It's an army car. Those times when you saw the army car, you're on the run. You know, it's not like here in the United States, you see the army, you know, everybody say, you know, thank you for your service. That Those days you never used to say thank you for your service. You're dead. Mm -hmm. And my dad got out. The first word he said, I vow to God. I vow to God that when I get out, when he saves me, like he did save me from the mouth of the lion, I will give him this nation. I need to go and pray and wait on the Lord. Now you're talking about the creativity of God. Mm -hmm. The way I knew it was a man who sold himself, sold his life, entire life, into the presence of God. We went to the church. He stayed there day and night. Now, as a young boy, I saw that. That's what grabbed my heart. I said, and then when he gets out of there, he goes to the church and he prays for the sick and lay hands on the people and they all get healed of all kinds of disease. And that time we never had better hospitals. We never had, um, you know, food and everything like that. The conditions were worse. Our hospitals were so full. To, they had stenches and everything. And so they were bringing people to the places of worship to be prayed for. And he's praying for them. And miracles were happening. Now, for me as a young boy, I'm like, Man, what, what just happened? I, you know, not knowing that was going to captivate me. That was going to pull me in. It was so beautiful. It was so, the presence of God was so beautiful around me. It made, it made me feel unique so powerful to the point that every time I went back to school, you know, I started to pray like my dad prayed, even when he was in the church, I go and spend time with him, not knowing that God was now beginning to draw me, to draw me as a young boy, you know, in, in it. And brother Dan, that never left me because up until that time, you know, God started to use me too. You know, I'm a young kid at age 13. I, I Now I have the opportunity after my, my father introduced me to Jesus. You know, now I feel like I need to seek God on my own. I read the word and wait on God and take the same presence. I took it to school. I remember laying hands on the kids in, you know, in a, a school who were sick. Of, you know, they were sick of fever, malaria and everything like that. They were getting healed. Now everybody's telling me, that young man, you know, he came over here. He prayed for us and we are well and everything like that. You know somebody who's hooked on the grace of God, the power of God. I, I, am, I was that pastor, man of God. And my life has never been the same again. Again, like you said, it was those tough conditions 
that made it so unique that we run into the hands of God and seek the face of God mm -hmm. and the power of God was released and my life was never was never the same again. Wow. You, you know, brother, I was just thinking as you were talking and the phrase that came to my mind is that creativity is contagious. Yes. You know, the creativity that worked within your father became contagious and a desire birthed within you to walk in the same type of creativity. I never wanted to live a powerless life mm -hmm. ever. I knew that knowing God was to be powerful yeah. and knowing God was to be empowered by the Lord to make a difference. Mm -hmm. So when I realized that, when I saw the difference my father was doing with just a little that he had, how that prayer, that vow that he prayed, I will give you back this country, literally came to pass. Mm -hmm. Because from seven people, you know, at our, at our fellowship, seven people who began that fellowship, that thing started to explode. And, and, and the process of it exploding also had to go through a, a great amount of warfare. Creativity, you know, doesn't happen for the sake of it happening. You have, we have to dislodge what's already there. Yeah. We have to dislodge the darkness. We have to dislodge the, the, the misconception, you know, unbelief, disbelief, all the things, fear timidity. For us, it was war. It was disease. It was witch doctors. It was everything. How do you, how are you faced with all this? And you wake up one day and you say, you know what? God is beyond all of this. Mm -hmm. God is more powerful than all of this. How do you do that? It's when the faith of God is, uh, you know, engulfed onto you. It's when you yeah. grab hold of the, of the truth that's beyond your circumstance, and that's what happened, Brother Dan. Wow. You know, Brother, I was just thinking that um, we, we can't really dispel darkness and strongholds in our culture if we're not able to displace them from out of our own life. We can't. You know, we, we that's where it begins, where faith has to become established within our own life. That's so and true. once it does, then the creativity that can begin to manifest outside of us uh, tell us a little bit about um, this encounter you had where there was, I think a baton was, was passed to you and you had an encounter where you had to go to the jungle and you had to go find God for yourself. And what, what happened in that situation? Wow. You know, as a, you know, I go back to that moment as, as I've been sharing with you, it's when I've been up by now, the church that began with seven people has now exploded, you know, Thousands of people are coming there. Miracles are happening. So you are in this tune to say, you know what? We finally arrived at the place where the, you see the ministry grow. And I'm in ministry. I travel different places until I had my checker. My checker is God has to reveal himself personal to me, mm -hmm. not just getting along to get along and be along and everything like that. So I remember this one day. And now I know why God set me up for that, you know. Because you would now trust me with bigger challenges or bigger things to do. Because on that very day, one lady calls at her home and my dad wasn't home, you know, because everybody knew that when you call my dad, prays for you, whether people are about to die, he prayed for them. They came back to life and everything like that. And guess what? The lady calls and I tell him my dad is not home. She said, don't worry about it. All of you guys are so anointed. You pray for the people. They get healed. Why don't you pray? My loved one is about to die in the hospital. And I picked up the call and I prayed on the phone. We said amen. And so, okay, that was a good evening. I remember it's almost like 2 p.m., you know, 2 p.m. around that time. And then my dad comes back around 5. Another phone call comes back. It's the same lady I prayed for around 2.30 and tells my dad, you know, I called and she's now furious. I called, my loved one is dead. I asked one of your, your, you know, your, your, your sons to pray and he's dead and she's very furious. Of course, she, she just wanted to tell my dad, you know what, because we knew the member of, of the member of the church and she wanted to tell my dad, but the, you could tell those frustration. And I didn't, at, up until that time, I didn't want to feel that, you know, up until then I've seen miracles happen. We pray for the sick and I'm around my father seeing miracles. You know, you could have come to a church and find stretchers. Sometimes we used to ban a full truckload of, uh, of, of stretchers and stuff that we had picked up from miracles that had happened everywhere. But this day, that miracle didn't happen. And I took it personal. I took it personal. Mm -hmm. And literally, 
by taking personal, it's like I looked at my dad's eyes and he looked at me and I felt like he was disappointed in me. And it didn't come out right. And it's not what he was trying to convey to me. You know, I think he was trying to be so sad for the mother and everything. And he gave me that eye. But because I'd already had this misconception of everything, I feel disappointed. I pray for somebody and they died. And I'm supposed to feel like, you know, I should have prayed for them. This could have been my first miracle for me to raise the dead, you know, in my thinking. And, you know, that's that creative power. And, um, and, and so when I looked at him, I ran to my room and I reached there and I started to weep and I started to cry. And I said to the Lord, I think, you know, you know, those prayers you say, you know what, I've just been getting along to get along. Uh, you know, I don't have the same grace with my dad. So I realized that because I see my dad pray for people who are about to die or even were dead and they rose up again. So I don't have that grace. So that's this disappointment. And I don't realize, Brother Dan, that all of that agonizing is going to push me to a place that little is going to revolutionize my life for the rest of my life. I, but I'm going through that. And I tell the Lord, I said, I don't know you like my dad. I, I know my dad told me about you and all the men of God I'm around, they told me about you, but I, I'm sh I don't know about you, Lord. You know, and every time I say that, there was something so free that was so freeing me from the attachment of what I thought I knew theologically and religiously, any step of, see the things that we get attached to just because we're around a good presence or good people and everything like that. This became a personal, personal, personal to me because the more I felt that God was taking away something from me, but then I was feeling empty and that I needed that emptiness as he was taking away the, just the experience of being around my dad there was an emptiness that was coming, that was starting to feel, you know, yeah. and that emptiness that was coming into me now was making me, making me long. I wanted, yeah. I didn't want to feel empty either, but I was disappointed. I'm going through the emotion back and forth. So now I'm such. Brother you, Mike, yeah. let me interject real quick, because so many times when people are in that place, they turn and they go the other way. They let doubt and unbelief and so guilt true. and shame, all these things pile yeah. in and yes. we turn and we go the other way. But you didn't do that. No, what, I never did did do? that. what did you I do? What did you do? I could I could have been disappointed. I could have been so broken. I could just say, this is it. I'm never going to be part of the church anymore, any fellowship mm -hmm. and everything like that. I could have thought of so many things because all of us have tried something and failed and gave up. But mm -hmm. I never did because this emptiness... I felt like if I walked away from the presence of God, what I just felt, that, that teaser that he had given me, I could have lost everything. So I never gave up. And so I ran away from home. I thought I was, when I hid in my room, a few days later, I ran away from home and I go to the jungle. And, and that was almost like 70, 80 miles away. So I could not just walk back, you know, mm. any kind of way. Say 80, 70 miles away, I ran and went to the jungle and I stayed there. I, I can't wait to take you there, Brother Dan, because that became my prayer wailing wall that I go when I'm in Uganda. And I stayed yeah. there right in the jungle. I could have been afraid in the night, the mosquitoes, the coyotes and everything. But there was this thing inside of me that was causing me to long. And I felt like if I kept searching, if I kept the way I was praying, I was going to, I was going to write, I'm going, I was going to, my prayers were going to be answered. Because literally my restlessness was, God, if I don't know you, I need to know you for myself. If you're for real, I got to know it. Mm -hmm. I got to know that you're for real for me. You, you are God. Just like you use my father, I want to see an experience in my personal life. But this has to be on a personal me and you. Mm -hmm. That's what took me there. I was not afraid of anything, anyone. Wherever I was, I was hidden in the presence of God. And brother, I stayed there for more than almost two weeks. Hmm. two weeks crying every night like a baby and weeping and restless and no, there's no the, 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 there's no shops no shopping anything and everything is just a way this i have never felt whatever that that presence of me that fell onto me you know that took me to that place and and, and my longing and crying was drawing me deeper. When I, when I reached there again, I said to the Lord, I don't know you. I, I don't. And, 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 I, and, and every time I get to this place, I begin to weep because it is that moment that, that's before you and God. It is that moment that every child of God that wants to find him has to get to. 
Mm-hmm. It's okay for you to say, God, I have had an experience with you somehow because of what I've been hearing, the good music in church and everything. But Lord, in my room, you maybe you don't have to go to the jungle, but in your bed, in your house. So Lord, reveal yourself to me in a way I have never experienced you before. That was me. Oh. That was me. Yeah. Brother Mike, let, let me just emphasize this because I think what you're saying is so powerful and profound. And it's so key to the creativity of God working in our life that we have to find him like that. We we have to set aside this our disappointments, our doubts, and our unbelief, and we have to find him like that so that his creativity can be released and manifest and real in, in our life. It's, it's so, so powerful, my brother. And that was, that was me, brother. Yes. I got tired of just the mundane, the easy things. And remember, I'm a kid that's hungry, mm-hmm. that needs a touch from God, that needs a total visitation from God. If it was not God, it wasn't going to be anything else. This is where young men, young boys get lost and, you know, they run into the world. But I was captivated. I was pulled in and I'm crying out to God. And, and I still remember that to this day. And that's why it makes me emotional because mm-hmm. I, I received an encounter, an encounter with God that, that messed me up in a good way because God himself was able to visit me as, as I become, I become so desperate. Is able to one of those one mornings. I, I every, it's like time stopped. Everything stopped, and the world stopped. It's like I couldn't see. It almost felt like the trees were not moving. Everything wasn't moving except I had this voice that could not make me move. And the voice said to me, "Just like I am with your father, mm. I am with you." Mm. I will walk with you and I'll take you to the nations. Mm. You, brother, the way I was feeling the glory of God, it's like a son who's hugging his father for the first time, but they all along knew that their father existed. This was me meeting my father, God, mm-hmm. meeting my father, God. And that, that, presence to this day as I speak about it, it messes me up. I feel like I could go back to the same place. Yeah. You know, it moved me and changed me, but it it empowered me. Mm -hmm. While I was there, I felt it. I knew it. Mm -hmm. My confidence was never the same. My life was never the same. My confidence was never the same. My Mm -hmm. faith was never the same. I could not even tell whether it was night and day, but all I know is the presence of God visited me and impacted me. Yeah. Well, brother, I'm on the edge of my seat and I know everybody else is too. What happened from there? And I remember so well that within that time, I had been invited to go speak to at a conference. And I... It, the way how it coincided together is that I'm I'm so desperate and I'm I'm away to this place and then comes this event and I happen to say you know what I'm going but this time I felt I had never felt this so much power my hands were literally heavy it was like a voltage you know like electricity was all over me and I said I'm going to this meeting I, I gotta go to this meeting and I get over there and it was two two more days left. That means it was me, the rest of the preachers that preached that week, was me to take over the two days. The first, first night of those day, two days left, the power of God hit that place so greatly. Miracle signs and wonders. This is me. Now, at first, I had gone through that situation where I prayed for somebody, they died. Now, God is showing me I'm present. I'm present in your life in the original way. It's me with you, Michael. You're not just going through the motions and experience of what you saw, but this is exactly God saying, my confirmation of my presence with you is activated right now. Mm-hmm. And I'm seeing it. I'm talking about creative miracles, Brother Dan. Creative miracles. Deaf ears are opening in seconds. You know, 
you know, legs, cripple, I mean, miracles, tumors are disappearing like that. Then towards that, the second day of the event, when miracles happened, I, you know, I remember so well asking, you know, when miracles were so ever, this is almost a thousand people in the place, even more than that, it was, that place was so packed. And I asked, how many, how many more have not received your miracle? I want you to walk up here. That's the question that I asked. And, and guess what? One of the ladies that was kept, I, there were so many miracles that were written in that building that it only, one, only one person showed up. And in Africa, there cannot be 1,000 people and there's only five who need miracles. It means there was almost two, 300 people that got healed. Then the lady walks up with his son and I'd never seen this situation. His son had been crippled in his hands and his feet and it was deaf and dumb. He could not hear. Literally, Brother Dan, just say, you've talked about the creative power of God. When you looked at that situation, you can look at God and say, no, this one you can do. You can do all the other ones, but this one, no. Because it was a cripple situation. On top of that, he could not hear. On top of that, he, he never talked. And the mother ran with him and to him right in front of everybody. And I look at that situation and literally my flesh. Now, this is where everybody watching right now has to listen because your, your, your flesh has to be tested to walk into this dimension. Even me who had prayed and coming out in the power and the excitement of what had happened, when I looked at this one kind of a situation, just like you can look at this one kind of a situation in your life and say, God, you've done everything else but this one. Maybe this cancer, maybe this heart problem, maybe whatever. We know how to choose what God can do because of our, our, our unbelief systems or whatever we, we, we get attached to. Mm -hmm. This was the situation that I looked at. And I said, why? But guess what? It doesn't end there. I looked back at the entire congregation. They all looked at me with eyes of faith. The entire place is quiet, nobody moving. Mm -hmm. And I looked at them. The eyes of faith were so charged. It's like they believed for what we've already seen God do, that's what God's going to do. When I saw that, my eyes saw them looking at me, looking at them. And I knew there was faith already charged in the room for this miracle to take place. There was, there was an activation of the power. Then I remembered, the, 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 then I remembered that the, a few weeks before, I had gone through praying for somebody that lost their life and it drove me to this place of brokenness and wanting to know God for who he is. And now I'm faced with this situation of a, of a boy who's crippled and his legs are twisted. And I remember a song falling into my spirit. And when that song did, I started to walk towards the boy. Before I could reach my hands to him, his legs started to twist and you could hear them like somebody straightening him out. They could say, and then he started to cry. I had, God allowed me to see a creative miracle right in front of me and in front of a thousand people. And the legs were going back to the original way, just like a normal human being stands. Mm -hmm. I picked the boy and he stood on his feet. I wish you could, I wish, not even wish him because I do have the pictures with me. I could next time, next time, in your broadcast, we'll bring it and put it on there. You could literally see him stretched. You know, his legs are stretched, his ears are open, and now he's not only deaf and dumb, he is also speaking, and the entire place of a thousand people erupts. It erupts in a mighty shout. And the, <laughs> and the reason why they're shouting, because the mother carried they carried the boy for 40 miles mm. and it brought him to the event. What type of faith does a mother have with this boy and bring him to an event? Mm. What type of faith? 40 miles, not 10, on his back. Carrying a five-year-old boy on the back and bring him to an event. It had nothing to do with the preacher coming because I wasn't known. It had had everything to do with an encounter with God, the creative power of God that was present to release a boy who had been crippled in his feet. Who had been crippled. Oh, my God. Nah. 
Oh my, brother Mike, brother Mike. I, I'm just thinking as you're talking. You know, all all these years later, that creative authority that manifests in your life has never left you. Never. It's been with you all the days never. since then, and. You know, this we can't do this in one night. Obviously, I mean, we need you to come back next week. Thank uh, you. We haven't even got you into to America yet. Yes, Thank <laughs> and you. and all that God has done through your life since you've been here, how He brought you here, and what He's yes. done here to birth an, a TV network that has a vision to to reach a billion souls around the world. Yes. The creativity of God only increases in the seasons we walk through. It increases and it increases and it increases. Yes, and this is this is how the God works with us, and there's no end. There, there's no limit to the increase that God can work into our Amen. life. Amen. And so, uh, could you, before we go, could you just pray for the listeners and just and just impart something to our to our listeners to to have that kind of encounter, to have that type of impartation that shifts their life with God's creativity. Somebody's faith has just been encouraged. Somebody's life has just been turned around because what we've done from beginning to the end of this broadcast, we've been talking about a God that's not a respect of any person. Yeah. We've been talking about a God who loves us and who loves you that he, he gave his only begotten son. That he didn't only give his son, but he gave you all. You have all. You own all. Concerning, concerning God, he gives you all. Because that's how he loves you. That's why he loves us. And so I pray in the name of Jesus that this Amen. radical encounter with God Amen. begins tonight. You will be fearless. You will be fearless. You'll be unbroken by whether it's been sickness and disease. We are talking about a God who can defy gravity. He can defy impossibilities. He, if he was able to get young boy, his name was Yoram. Yoram, which means Joseph, Joel. You know, he's, he, ever since his miracle, his village, there's many churches that have been planted because of that one miracle. Because when they saw that, when they saw what happened to their boy, who they knew, everybody knew, uh, churches began to sprung up. That's a move of God. And I pray that that's a move of God can hit your home. That's same, don't say, Lord, I don't deserve it. I haven't prayed like you have prayed. No, God doesn't base it on what you've done, what you haven't done. He wants you to be longing and desiring him. He will move in your life like never before. Thank you, Brother Dan. Thank you. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> brother Mike, I can't I can't wait to, to have you back next week. Um, Thank you. You know, I am currently uh, out of town in Washington State. Yes. And uh, I'll be back tomorrow. Uh, we'll get together this week. I know I it. God is doing so much uh, in this season. And the yes. creativity of God, like I said, is only continued to increase in your life. Amen. And, and so there's something that happens when you experience that type of creativity. Yes. It now becomes the lens by which you look at the world. You see things, yes. With the expectation that God will create something bigger than you. Powerful. And that's who I you've been ever since I've known you. That's who yes. you've challenged me to be and to walk in. And yes, um, I just, I love you, brother. And uh, you too. I, I can't wait till next week. I and, look forward uh, to seeing you. Thank you, man of God. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Blessings. All right. Thank you. Man. I told you I was excited. <laughs> Please, you, you got to share this with, with everyone you can think of to share it with. Invite them to be back next week. You, you haven't even begun to hear the story. And so uh, I know that this broadcast is in my ministry group on Facebook. It's not shareable, but you can go to YouTube. It's also there. Search YouTube by putting in the creativity of God, Dan Justice. If you search that on YouTube, you will find the broadcast there and you can share them. Uh, so share them, invite people for next week. And uh, I believe that God is moving and will open up and impart to each one of us a new dimension, a new dynamic, a new day, a new season, uh, his creative work in our life. So I again, thank you. 
and we will see you soon. Thank you.